nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So this lecture segment deals with quantum charge self-consistency. So previously I had shown you a linear potential drop and that was a Mickey Mouse device, so no real charge. Then I showed you that if you just consider semi-classical charge, you see strong band bending and charge. And then the next one, uh, we dealt with the filling of the emitter states that are due to uh, this triangular well that you have due to the realistic charge. Now we're going to make the charge more realistic. Instead of a semi-classical charge, we'll do it with quantum charge. So why would you do that? So in all the previous simulation I had shown in these lecture segments, we had dealt with a semi-classical charge that was computed in the so-called Thomas Fermi approximation or standard semi-classical textbooks textbook expressions for charge. And the result is that if you say equilibrium, you have a flat Fermi level and you have a doping profile, highly doped, 1E18 on the left and the right, and then no intentional doping in the middle. You have electrons flow in into the center device region. And since it, there's nothing quantum mechanical, you have step-like behavior of charge inside the well and right next to the well. Right? You just march through, you have a constant Fermi level, and for a constant Fermi level you get a constant charge, and there's no wave function or anything like that. So if you took that resulting potential and you did a one-pass quantum calculation on top of that, just to see how charge would really look like in this potential, what you find is, well, the charge would be rounded. You wouldn't have that sharp edge. You would have charge in the barriers, because there's tunneling. And you would have rounded charge in the middle. And the charge would be less than the quantum charge because that resonance is way up in energy. It's not occupied. It's virtually empty. Versus in classical calculation, there's no energy result, right? It just looks at the Fermi level and the band edge and it puts classical charge there. Okay, so the numerical quantum mechanical uh, behavior results in a smooth charge in the emitter collector, charge in the barriers, and around the charge profile in the central RTD. Now if you apply a voltage, what you see is that that artificial spike that we knew was already artificial is getting smoothed out, right? You have a wave function that is sitting in the triangular well. It has a shape to it. So the charge is not piled up against the interface, but it's actually removed from the interface. And you've seen that in some uh, calculations for MOSFETs probably. The charge in the center of the RTD now looks larger than the semi-classical charge, and it's rounded again. And you have charge uh, in the barriers. So why is this charge now larger? So let's look at that from a sort of intuitive point of view. If you have uh, carriers tunneling from the left and to the center device and to the right, Let's assume the structure is roughly symmetric. That means you hop into the site, you hop out of the site. And if it's symmetric, that means that device should be half empty. Right? For a given current, it can carry some charge. Right? Half of the time it's full, half of the time it's empty. Right? Steady state flow, in a sense. Right? That means that state should be half full. That means the Fermi level should be such at a place that it's generating a half full Fermi level. But the central RTD is a non-equilibrium. There is no Fermi level defined. So the semi-classical calculation assumed that the Fermi level dropped and that's how the assumption was. Here in non-equilibrium green functions we don't assume a Fermi level. We get the charge automatically and roughly it should be half uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the state in a symmetric device. 
Okay, that's why that charge is actually larger than the semi-classical charge which dropped the potential halfway, the Fermi level halfway. Now we get to the real can of worms, which is if you include this relaxation in the reservoirs, I mentioned that the Hamiltonian becomes non-Hermitian. It's not only becoming non-Hermitian, you, you spread the density of states out in energy. And if you do that and you don't completely conserve the density of states in this very simple scattering model, you effectively modify the density of states. And the result here is that in this very simple relaxation model, you only capture roughly 80% of the charge. So we lost 20% of the charge. So we would have to make that up by making the uh, effective masses a little heavier. You typically don't do that. We typically don't mess with that effect. But if you're honest to goodness, you actually have a little bit, you lost a little bit of charge since you made your eta energy dependent. All right. So now let's look at a, a, a current voltage characteristic that we would compute. So here, I had shown this trace of energies already. Now I'm flashing this green line here through the structure. That's the central resonance C1, and it's roughly dropping linearly in the semi-classic potential, right? It's resisting a little bit to being pulled down because the emitter has a lot of charge in it. So it doesn't move quite as fast as the collector. All right. So, but there's current flow in the device, right? So if there's current flow, that means that there's charge in the emitter, uh, in, in, the, in the central device. And if there's charge in the central device that doesn't belong because there's no doping, it likes to float up. Right? It tries to resist getting more charge into that bucket because it doesn't belong. So it tries to float up, so you have to pull down harder, in a sense, to get that resonance down. So how would that look? So the electrostatic potential should push against that charge filling. So if we turn on charge self-consistency in a Hartree form, what you see is this resonance here coming down almost linearly, and it's starting to couple to the emitter state too, but it's pretty broad, so not a lot of charge is uh, uh, sitting in there. But now it's starting to couple to the emitter state E1. There's more charge flowing through the structure, so there's more charge in the well, and you have to pull harder on the voltage lever to pull it down, so the resonance is actually sort of slowing down its pace of being pulled down. It doesn't get pulled down linearly anymore. It actually sort of almost floats. I mean, if you go fishing and you put a bobber in the water, you have to actually pull it harder down, right? You have to have a real weight for that to go underwater, okay? It's kind of like that. I mean, you, your resonance sort of floats on top of the Fermi C, and then you have to pull it harder. And when it empties out, when there's no more charge, it actually just plops down because there's nothing that pulls it back up. Okay, so there's a sort of a charge filling effect. So there's more and more charge, and at some point, it can fill up enough charge and it plops down as voltage. So you have a really nonlinear behavior. So the resonance floats up in the sea of electrons and plops down, and then it, since it's empty, now it drops linearly. Okay? That means it modifies the whole relationship and coupling to E1 and E2. It happens at different spaces in energy, so to speak. So the emitter potential floats up. You can also see it here, right? Just slightly, though. And the central resonance fills with charge. The central potential floats up, resists further charge filling, and the central resonance floats up. <laughs>